Hey guys, it's Dr. Ray with TheManualTherapist.com. I had a patient recently who was referred to me, but I couldn't do the evaluation because he could only come when his wife came, and I needed to see his wife as well. Uh, she's a chronic Crips patient, but she's another case for another time. Anyway, he didn't want to be at the clinic in the first place because he was convinced that his chronic hip pain, which was only felt in driving um, and not in, not in actually in sitting or riding in a car, but only in driving, was caused by a loose wire from a hip arthroplasty gone wrong. So the first thing we would lo we looked at, and I told my student to look at, was side gliding and standing, and, and you know, sure enough, he had a limitation in side gliding and standing to that side. So there's a loading issue to the right side. Repeated side gliding and standing against the wall, so self shift correction, actually decreased his pain. So the patient definitely remained unconvinced, and I saw my students struggling as to try to convince him to do this simple exercise and movement. At the end of the visit, when my student said he had to do it 10 times an hour, he kind of balked at it and rolled his eyes and said, well, that's crazy. So the next visit, he came in and said he was essentially no better, but he also really wasn't compliant with the exercises. So I had a little talk with him, and, and the talk basically was, it was purely mechanical. And even though I tried to move away from uh, pure disc theory, in this case, he, he wasn't absolutely not going to buy anything but mechanical. He was so focused on, you know, this wire, this wire that was stuck in his hip. So basically where we started off first was I, I said, look, if, if there's really a wire in your hip, it would bother you in all sitting positions or, or in, in most positions. I said, can you walk? Can you stand? Because, uh, you know, he didn't want to sit on the table. He was just kind of cross and sitting there with his arms like this and kind of harumph, harumph. So I said, look, does it hurt you standing right now? And he said, no, it doesn't. I said, does it hurt you sitting in a chair? Does it hurt you riding in a car? And he said, no, it doesn't. And I said, well, when does it hurt you? He said, only driving. And I said, look, there's got to be something mechanical about this, and more than likely it's your back versus your hip because there's a lot of different positions and movements like stairs and squatting and lunging and all these other things that don't bother you but only sitting and driving does. So so static sitting plus driving is what bothers it. And the difference between driving is that your, your hip is a little lower than your knee and this being your right leg, your knee is raised up a little bit. So it does place a little bit of load on your spine and studies show that you know, the intradiscal pressure is a thousand times greater in sitting than it is in standing. So that, that pretty much got him intrigued, and he, he wanted to know more. So for me, it was all about using a progressive series of logical arguments as to, to get him to do the exercises. Because my student, he did nothing wrong, but the patient didn't buy it. You know, and Butler talks about recently about a patient not having... Uh, emergent neurosignatures, and if they, if they don't believe what you're saying or essentially buy into what you're saying, you got to try something else, you know. And I'm not going to just work on him to try to get him to buy into a certain theory because that could be two or three more visits, two or three more copays. This guy was driving an hour to see us because his wife convinced him to see us. So I used whatever tools I had in my bag in terms of explanations to get him to buy into it. So in his case, he wanted to hear mechanical load theory. He wanted to hear disc theory. I got him to push a little bit further into end range against the wall. I gave him a little bit of overpressure with my hands against his hip. That completely abolished his pain because he had very, very minor ache in standing and walking at that point, even though he really didn't call it pain. So he said, wow, you know, that works really well. I'm going to have to look into this. And I said, you have to do that hourly. And I said, I know that you told my student that it would be crazy to do it hourly, but how about this? This just made you better. This just made you feel your right hip feel like your left hip for the first time in standing and walking for who knows how long. I said, I think you'd be crazy not to do this 10 times an hour. And he said, that is a very logical argument. And I can see that tool, you know, he, was, he wasn't defensive at all. He was happy. He was smiling. The next thing we did was got into the car. I gave him a lumbar roll. I adjusted his seat. I got his hips to be as level with his knee as possible, we just sat there for 10 minutes because he said, you know, my symptoms normally come on in five minutes. So after 10 minutes, he still had, was symptom free. I told him to give us a call uh, at the end of his an hour drive or so and let me know how he did. Now he didn't give us a call, but I am expecting him in later and I think that he will do fine. So 
in, in the end, even though we are trying to get away from purely pathoanatomical models, I think it is useful to explain them, to, to use them as explanations for patients who aren't going to buy an updated modern neuroscience model. Uh, so that, that's uh, the vidcast for this week, and any questions you can email me.